So what we want to do today is talk about what does it mean to be a human being? Yeah? Because all of our work has to do with that. The whole of anthroposophy has to do with that. Yeah? So, in our work and study, we get many different cosmic pictures, just beautiful, overwhelming pictures about the human being, about nature, about the senses, about the planets, and on and on and on. And the thing that really is important to remember is that we really, as human beings, are the center of everything. Yeah? And this is what's wonderful about the Waldorf curriculum. Each year, right, from the early childhood all the way through the grades, is each year is a recapitulation of our history as human beings from ancient times all the way up to modern times. Yeah? So modern history is not even begin to be dealt with until they're in eighth grade, I think, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I think it's eighth grade. And then it goes further on into high school you know, current history and so on. But so we start out with the oral traditions, right? In the early childhood. And many schools, when they start to do outer talks in the world or they're going to do their accreditation and independent school people come, they get all worried. Our school did that. They were all worried. Oh, well, they want to know if we do reading and if we do this and if we do that. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's just look at this a different way. Let's go with our strengths. It's not that we don't teach reading. It's that we do tremendous amount of language enrichment <laughs> starting in the early childhood, right? And that's based on ancient traditions of oral, this oral passing on of and building up, right? of experiences and memories, collective memories. Now, the whole thing with the young child, as we see, they ask you again and again as a parent, tell me when I was born, or tell me when you were little, or tell me about grandma. They want to hear the same story. Tell me when you saw the bear, right? Tell me when we got our dog. They want to hear it over and over again. And what are they asking? Helping to build the foundation of, of, his, of their history as part of the family, right? Belonging to the group, right? And there are different cultures that this is very strong process, right? And you have extended family around. The grandparents, great-grandparents, aunts and uncles, and this is all of them are getting these stories Right? And this input. And it, what does it do for the child? It helps them feel secure and that they belong. Right? And then gradually, as they go through the grades, we build this up into the kindergarten with, uh, in the first grade, really, with the fairy tales. And these are archetypes. When I ran my uh, Waldorf kindergarten in Ann Arbor, Michigan years ago, there I was, it was the first. Waldorf for inspired activity for children. All the rest was for adults, right? Even the festivals at Steiner House there. And I said, oh, I'll do the festivals for the children. They'd hear the wonderful violinist Miha Pogachnik play his fabulous, you know, violin pieces, yeah? They weren't appropriate for little kids. They'd all start crying and want to be taken out because the music wasn't for them. Right? It wasn't pentatonic and it wasn't melodious. Right? It was too cerebral. Okay? So I said, okay. I couldn't bear it. I said, I'll take them. So we did puppetry and I did your wrist me and we did crafts. We did stories for the festivals. Yeah? So it, these archetypes. So I had this kindergarten and I used to meet you know, once a week with a meeting with all the early childhood programs in the whole of Ann Arbor. And you know, that's the University of Michigan. So it's a real cerebral town, right? Wonderful, but... And um, so when we came, each of us, to tell what we were doing, and I talked about the... Oh, we got the baby monitor. 
very good. Oh, you are very wise parents over there. Uh, and I talked to them about fairy tales. The first thing that came up in them is, well, this is very sexist, and this is, you know, racist, and this is, you know, right out of the head. And I said, well, if you watch the children and then see how they play with these stories, they're archetypes. These little children, without it being up here intellectually, all know that all these different elements, you know, the donkey, the witch, the king, the princess, the queen, the grandmother, all of these archetypal elements live within them and live in their environment. They know it's part of them. Of course, they're the center of their universe. Remember that, the little ones. So, and that's what they experience. And these archetypal images feed a deep part of their being, which is in an archetypal form still. Yeah? In other words, they're going through stages, which we'll talk about later in the week, that all human beings go through in their development and why that is important. So these archetypal elements are very important for these little kids. This is why I say first, second grade, it's all about training. You know, how to be in a desk with the others and so on. So the curriculum then evolves all the way through and each stage that they're at and you go through, it's fabulous to see developmentally where the children are at different stages, the nine year change. They're doing farming and building. How perfect is that? Because they're building their physical body in a new way and they're coming into the earth in a new way and this supports them. The other thing that I feel is very important is that we also look at the social emotional side of what happens at each of these stages because they're crises, they're thresholds, they're rites of passage that we have to help them through. And as teachers, we need to address that as well. And I think today, the class teacher has more challenges than ever before. Just as parents, we have more challenges than ever before. Yeah. But the human being is the center of everything. Yeah? So, part of it is, is that you look out to the universe, and this is a picture of the human being. Right? The zodiac, the planets. The zodiac in ancient times, everyone knew it created the structural body of the human being. I don't know if I brought it with me, but I have a... A, a drawing, and you've probably seen this gorgeous painting where there's this golden oval that the human being stands in, and there at each stage there's the different symbols for the zodiac and picture of the zodiac on different body parts. I know I'm a cat, part of me is Capricorn, so you know, we can do it in your me together, but um, those are the big joints, especially the knees, right? all the major joints have to do with Capricorn, mm -hmm. right? Interesting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You think of a stubborn Capricorn, but it's all about flexibility of the joints. Isn't that fascinating? Mm -hmm. Scorpio, right, the scorpion, and the balance to that is the ego. Mm -hmm. It's a dual sign, yeah? But that has to do with the different structural part of the body. The planets, on the other hand, have to do with our organs. They're connected to the inner organs. And I can talk about those later in the week. It's just fascinating. So, we are the microcosm. There is the macrocosm. You can never get out of it. We are the center of it. This is how incredible we are. We're the only beings in the universe that are, have freedom the possibility of freedom. And along with freedom comes the creation of evil. Right? So we have choices. We have choices all the time. And where do we get the raw material to transform? We get it out of our, our nature. And as we transform it and we take hold of it, we become freer beings because we're able to choose what direction we're going to go in. And as we overcome our past karma, 
something comes towards us from the future. So when we come to look at children in our care, and I'm going to show you a big picture tomorrow about that that helps. I got lots of things to show you. Uh, we have the different streams. We have this archetypal stream and then we have this personal karmic stream. So our question always is, when we have the children in front of us, who stands before us? Who is this being that stands before us? They may present in a certain way. See, she agrees 100%. Thank you for that. But it's also, who is this being? And sometimes you get a little glimpse with the child. It doesn't matter what age. You can almost see them as a teenager, right? Or as an adult. You get a little glimmer of who they are. And it's challenging. This is why I feel that what Robin brought about this, the super sensible side of our work, carrying the children at night, picturing them, holding them, and you wake up in the morning and you get a little inspiration or a little answer to your question. When two or more of us gather together to hold and care for and create an image together of this child, the next day you come in and you're saying, this child, you know, struggling with a certain issue, and the next day you come in and already you see a change in the child. You didn't talk to them about it. But because you carried it yourself, but then you shared it and carried it together with your colleagues, this has an actual reality, a real force that affects this little being in his sleep life or her sleep life at night and manifests in the day. Yeah? So our attitude, and we know this with early childhood children, they don't just imitate, as I said to you before, what we do, they imitate the moral gesture, right? They imitate our attitude. If we're doing something and we don't really like it, what do you think they see? They see our disdain for it, right? And as I always say, you have to be authentic. You have to be real. You don't have to know everything, but you have to manifest what, who you are and what you know. Because they look into our eyes, they don't hear our words, they see our, the meaning of those words right through us. So they say, can I trust you? And we have many children today, trust is their biggest issue. And I was visiting in Princeton one time years ago, long time ago, and I was sitting in a little chair at the table and the children were in free play and some were helping make snack and so on. And I was there to mentor the kindergarten teacher. And uh, this little boy who has a lot of challenges, parents are all split up and a lot of stuff's going on between them which affects him. He comes, he's watching me all the time everywhere he is in the room. And I'm talking to other children and humming and all that. And he's always looking at me because I'm new, you see. I'm the stranger. And he comes over and he slaps his hands on the table. And he looks right at me and he said, can I trust you? There's, he's telling right away, this is his issue. And I said, absolutely. So go and play. And off he goes and he's happy. He didn't look at me ever again because he didn't need to keep, he figured it out. He had to come and say. And I said to the teacher and the group that were working with this challenging child, this is the first thing you have to address. And then we worked, tried to work with the parents who were really, it was all about all the karma that they had with each other that was the real problem. And he was kind of caught in the middle. I would say abandoned in the middle. So, and this often happens. So, we're going to just talk a little bit about um, image and perception, okay? And we're going to do that throughout the whole two weeks because it's all about that. What you perceive is your reality. What a parent perceives, you may not agree with them, but that's their reality. Same with the children, right? So we need to get a sense of what are they... What is their perception? 
here? What are they seeing? So I have these little games, you know? So we have this picture. This is one of them. There's tons of these. I love these things, right? So just look at this, okay? Now this is not a test. There's no right or wrong, so don't worry about that, okay? We always have to be right, don't we? Can you see it all right? Okay, this is one of them. All right, so raise your hand if you see an old woman almost like a witch. Okay, you just take care. Now, how many of you see a beautiful young woman turned away? You see that? It's all right. Don't worry if you can't. How many of you see both? Can move back and forth between both? Yeah? All right. Now let me show you. Okay. If that was any higher, you'd need a ladder back there. Um, so if I cover this, this is a necklace. This is the front of her her neck here in a fur coat. She has this beautiful big headdress. Here's her nose and her ear and her eyelash and the feather on the front of her hat and she's turned away. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. That's the young woman. Can you see that? If I cover here, I think it helps a little bit. This is her chin, right? Okay? Now I'm taking this away and here's the chin and this is the nose and this is the eye of the old hag, I'll say. That's a good word, isn't it? A hag. Okay, you got that? Okay? So, this is inter This is really important. Now, this one's a little harder to see. It's a little more difficult to see. I know you've got to kind of squint your eyes up. I'll walk around so you see this. It's okay. If I show you the back, the light coming through the back, it's easier to see, so I won't let you see that. Okay? Can I, should I lift this up for you, David? Okay? If you don't see something, it's okay. Don't worry about it. I'll point it out to you anyway. All right? Okay. All right, raise your hand if you want to guess what it is. I'm going to tell you anyway. Go on. Cow. A cow. More of a calf, but it's a cow. Is the same for you? Is that what you were going to say? Good. So here's how it is. Here's the nose, right? Here are the eyes. Here's one ear. The other you can't see because it's dark. See that? Do you, can you see? Right? If you looked at the back and saw the light shining through, it's easier to see. I see it very well myself through the back. But there are many of these different kinds of pictures, and I think they're helpful to just remind us that we're all seeing this, right? We may have different perceptions of it, but they're all still true. We're just seeing it from a different vantage point. And as we go through this week, we'll talk about Robin Will, and I'll do it from another point of view, from learning uh, in the grades and so on, um, and early childhood with development of the 12 senses. But this idea of 12 points of view, that are we able to stand and look and say, okay, this is the vantage point that I'm at, like with the children, right? But sometimes we need to stand over this side and look from another way. Or we have a colleague and we say, oh, now describe to me why, how you're saying this about the child. Tell me what you're seeing. And I do that with doctors who say, oh, this is a, a mercury child. They go, something like that. Or even the temperaments. And you, I always say, please describe to me what it is you're actually observing that has given you that diagnosis or, you know, label for the child. Tell me what you're seeing. We need to ask why. 
just like when we see the children doing repetitive activities, right, and especially how behavior is, we want to ask, why does the child need to do this? Why does the child always, you know, knock things over? Or why does the child always do certain things? We can say that about our adults, too. But we don't usually, you know, we have to be careful about that. Um, because there's a reason. Because behavior, which is so much today of what we're addressing and looking at and complaining about or trying to work with, is a symptom it's the end product. It's a symptom. It's not the cause. And over these couple of weeks, I'll be talking a lot about what are the possible causes and how can we learn to observe in such a way that we can get a little inkling of what might be the source of, of this behavior or issue and then how can we meet it. Because if we just go to try to meet the behavior without also finding out the cause, then it won't last. It won't imprint deep enough. Because our job as teachers, as educators, is to help these children come into their bodies in a healthy way, work with their senses in a healthy way, and come into the world as human beings. And as parents and teachers, the hardest job in the world is being a parent. The second hardest is being a good teacher, right? Because we don't have a handbook on each of them, right? So that's why we also need to go on always, and we'll talk about that through these weeks, and I'm sure Robin has already, about how we work on ourselves as teachers. The, and in the trainings that I do and that I know David has taken, the inner life of the teacher is vitally important because actually the whole of anthroposophy is about self-development and not self-development to be better than everyone else but self-development to stand as a real what in German it's a mensch right? Mm -hmm. They translate that as man but it's actually a real true human being right? Who's able to really not just take from the world but represent the, the spirit right in every aspect of our lives, yeah? So, what I'd like to do, we have until when? Until three. Okay, great. Um, so, what I'd like to do is I would like to, uh, we've got a bunch of exercises to do. All right? This is fun. Because all the things that we're doing, and you have that in the teacher training, and you have that in the remedial training, is that um, program, whatever we want to call it, we come up to meet our own thresholds. Because we all have things that we meet that we find difficult, right? And a lot of what we meet, and I said that in the parent workshop last weekend, this past week, it's only Monday? Um, is that often the challenges that we meet, it might come up when you're doing form drawing or it might be learning to play the recorder, whatever, is that these often are fears or anxieties or issues that go right back to our own childhood that is buried very deeply. Yeah? So we need to be good to ourselves and go, okay, all right. How can I go about learning this? How can I overcome this? And the verse that we say, hi, the verse that we say in the remedial work um, is one that wasn't given exactly as a verse from Rudolf Steiner, but it's come, it's all from Rudolf Steiner, but it's been pulled together in different, from different sources. And it says, our rightful place as educators is to be removers of hindrances. Each child in every age brings something new into the world from divine regions, and it is our task as educators to help remove bodily and cyclical obstacles out of their way, to remove hindrances so that the child may enter in full freedom into life. So, does this mean that we're helping them 
adjust or change or heal some of their karma? Absolutely. But isn't that what we're doing as Waldorf teachers? Isn't that what we're doing as parents? Yeah? We're receiving who comes to us and we're helping them through the labyrinth so that one day they can meet their true destiny. And who knows what that's going to be, right? And the other little tidbit that we have to remember is that morality doesn't come with us from the spiritual world. It is created and developed here on earth. So this is the place to be. And I think as teachers, we need to stand in front of the children. You know, even how we dress or how we take care of ourselves to say, hey, come on, so glad you got here. Let's see what we can do. This is a great adventure we're on, yeah? And to have the courage, the moral courage to meet the challenges that we have because every human being has challenges. Even those with a perfect this and a perfect that, you know? I met someone who, an adult who said, oh, so wise, he's a university professor, you know, everything, written books, everything. Well, in Eurythmy, he couldn't do a circle. He couldn't move a circle. And he would get lost. And, I, and he said, oh, I had a perfect childhood. And I thought, well, developmentally, something happened here if you can't move a circle. Because you can't, if you can't picture it, whether it's fantasy or whether it's imagination, if you can't picture it, you can't move it. But we can teach ourselves how to do that, right? So we have so much to talk about. But let us go, um, I think, out into the big room so we have room and we'll do our exercises, all right? Yes? The, uh, the young, uh, young campers are napping. Oh, are they? Are they napping in the room that we... Yeah, I don't want to be out in a field, though. They're not in the room. We can go right here. Right? In, Is it better if we go into the room that's between the two? We're not going to make a lot of noise, well, unless you drop the copper rods, which is probably possible. No, I don't think you will. No, because you're going to be with a partner. It's okay. So what would you like us to do? I think we'd be best, and why don't we try this first one in the room? In the room? In the room? Okay. Okay, well just wait one second. I'm going to tell you, these exercises that we're going to do is a sequence out of the extra lesson, which I will talk to you about probably next week fully, right? This is Waldorf Remedial Developmental Therapy that can support right in the classroom and be done individually. I bound mine because it, you know, it falls apart. Um, these are a sequence that come into a, a category called stretching and lifting. Now, we know from physiology that the muscles only do one of two things. They either extend or they contract, right? Clear? Yeah? And Steiner talks about this in a little bit different way, and so does Audrey, and that the stretching element is going into gravity, going into, and this is important that we feel gravity. It's important that a child crawls and is on their tummy and their back on the floor. That's two-dimensional space. A whole series of muscles develop, we'll talk about it more later, and it helps with certain early stages of brain development. Every movement has to do with connect, it's all connected. You're never not just doing one thing. We're, we're too smart for that. It's very complex. So, um, and it's very important that we overcome gravity to stand in the vertical. And now we're in three-dimensional space. This is why that miracle of standing, walking, speaking, thinking in the first three years is so important. And a lot of it, for many children, happens almost in the first year. Okay? So, um, stretching and lifting. Everything we do has to be, is about connecting to gravity, which helps us feel secure and grounded, right, and healthy in ourselves. And the other side is lifting out of gravity. 
So the minute the child can stand in the vertical, we'll go over this again. It's not the first time you're going to hear it. Now the arms are free to be used in a different way. And the breathing changes, right? And creativity changes. So the hands, the arms are not, you know, bound in gravity anymore, and they're free. So these exercises help with stretching and lifting. And it's important for us as educators who stand in front of the children that when we lift our arms, we're able to freely, completely lift our arms because we'll see lots of this or this, you know, and no awareness of being able to really fully get full range of motion. So we want to make sure that we, as the, the person the children are imitating, are really able to do that ourselves, okay? So we're going to do these exercises. Now I'll be, and we can go. We need to eat, you need a partner and only one rod. 